Homecoming Happenings 90 brought out Raider Faithful from years gone by. It brought out Homecoming Queens in an election that featured surprises and tears to the eye. Beauty and pageantry were the order of the day. And the Black Stallion circled the field to get the Raiders and the Baylor Bears underway. So let's go. It's week five of the video season ticket. I can hardly bear it. everybody, Ray Gaskin, welcome to Homecoming Day at Jones Stadium in Lubbock, where 48,000 fans have gathered to watch the Red Raiders and the Baylor Bears. First quarter action, quarterback Robert Hall throws complete over the middle to Rodney Blackshear. Let's have another look at this, as you see the excellent crowd of Texas Tech faithful watching on Homecoming Night. Hall, a true redshirt freshman, getting his first start in place of the injured Jamie Gill. Now, a few plays later, the drive stalls. Lynn Elliott's 31-yard field goal attempt is no good, so there is still no score in the game. On Baylor's first possession, the reverse goes to Lee Miles, and Miles gains 23 yards for the Baylor Bears. On the very next play, quarterback Brad Gable back to pass, throws directly to Charles Rowe, who makes the interception for the Red Raiders and returns it 14 yards to midfield. Now it's first and 10 at the 50-yard line as the Red Raiders are back on the attack. Quarterback Robert Hall looking over the middle, complete to Richard Ross for a gain of 21 yards. But there is a flag on the play. Clipping penalty wipes this out, but it is worth another look. As you see Hall throwing to Richard Ross, watch the good move by Ross on the play. So on the very next play from the 45-yard line, Hall going to the air again along the sidelines, and it's Richard Ross, number 85 again, for a gain of 18 yards. But this drive stalls like the first one did. This time, Elliott's 44-yard field goal attempt is no good. So the Red Raiders have missed on two scoring opportunities. Now it's Baylor's football, and look, let's watch what happens here as David Loeb fumbles the ball, and Charlie Rowe recovers for Texas Tech. Three plays into this drive. Hall is back to pass. He's looking for Lloyd Hill. Another outstanding game by Lloyd Hill. Gain of 16 yards. Hall is back to pass. He throws, but it is picked off beautifully by McFarlane of the Baylor Bears. Now we go to second quarter action. There is a fumble on this snap, though, and Texas Tech's Mike Lissio comes up with the recovery. So immediately it's Tech on the attack. Hall to throw, looking for Byron Hooper. And Hooper's got it for a gain of 15. Let's watch from the ground level on the replay as Hall connects. Hall set, by the way, a single game tech pass attempt record with 47 throws in the ballgame. Hall to Lynn on the pitch. He rambles for 19 yards. Now later, second down at the one yard line, and Hall sneaks it in for the touchdown. And Lynn Elliott boots the extra point. 35-yard drive ends with the Red Raiders on top by a score of 7 0. Big play in the game here. Quarterback Brad Gable is back, but he's sacked by Rowe for a loss of eight. And we'll see on the replay here. Gable is injured on this play, suffers a broken right hand, and unfortunately for the Bears, is out for the season. Now Baylor back to punt. The kicker bobbles the snap, avoids his safety, but only gets off a six-yard boot. So the Red Raiders have excellent field position at the 16-yard line. However, they're unable to take it in for the touchdown, so Lynn Elliott tries a 30-yard field goal. It's blocked by the Bears, and there goes the loose football. Who's going to be able to scoop it up? The ball still bouncing around all the way across midfield. And finally, number 20, Malcolm Frank of the Bears does scoop it up and almost takes it into the end zone. Finally tackled at the one-yard line. On the very next play, tailback Mike Moore gets the call for the yard out, and the Bears convert for the touchdown. The extra point good. As you see, 7-7 seven seven the score. Now, the Red Raiders' next possession. Paul's pass, though, picked off here by Welch, deep in the Baylor secondary. But there is a flag on the play, and 
It is against Baylor, so it's still Tech's ball. Land on the draw play. As Texas Tech has new life, he rambles to the 17-yard line two plays later. Hall looking to throw again, rolls out to the right, throws to the end zone, and Lachey Matson intercepts in the end zone. Let's watch this again. Hall scrambling out to the right. Matson with the diving pickoff for the Baylor Bears. Now it's quarterback J.J. Joe at the controls for Coach Grant Taft's Bears. He throws complete over the middle to Lee Miles for a gain of 31 yards. All the way down to the one yard line. Next play, Edwin Rothell, the tailback, goes in for the score, and Baylor now leads 14 to 7 at the half. It's time for our feature a visit with former tech great Joe Barr. My brother was playing football at Abilene Christian at the time, and I just thought, wow, if I could play for Abilene Christian. <laughs> And then uh, after my senior year, I started getting phone calls from Bear Bryant at Alabama. Uh, see Chuck Fairbanks in Oklahoma, Daryl Royal in Texas. It just, you know, blew my mind. And I was like a kid in the candy store. And, uh, but I decided to take it very serious, the, the recruiting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I decided after I was named the number two blue chipper in the state of Texas that I, if the Southwest Conference coaches thought that much of me, that I wanted to stay in the Southwest Conference. And so uh, I narrowed it down to three schools, mm -hmm. Texas, Tech, Texas, and SMU. Mm -hmm. And visited those three. And of course went down to Texas and they had just won the national championship. And so I was, I was very eager to go there, but for some reason my dad did not want me going there. Mm -hmm. And then I visited uh, SMU and uh, went to a fraternity party. <laughs> and guys kept talking about the stock market. I said, yeah, we got a lot of cattle out in Big Lake. <laughs> so I was kind of a, a misfit, you know. Uh, and of course, Dallas was such a big city to me at the time. And SMU, uh, I was just an outcast of SMU. And then when I went to visit Tech, and uh, kids were wearing blue jeans and boots and uh, a skull in the back pocket, I knew I was at home. <laughs> and, uh, so I went to get telling my dad uh, one day that uh, Daryl Royal had called me and said, you know, we're going to have scholarships. We've got to have a commitment. And, uh, you know, as serious as I was about it, I said, well, I'm not ready to sign yet. I, you know, just haven't made up my mind. I said, well, I'm going to have to give it to somebody else. And that just about did it then. So I went home and told my dad what Daryl Royal said. And he says, well, he said, what do you want to do now? I said, well, I guess Tech's it. He said, well, go call Coach Carter. <laughs> so we went and called Coach Carter and told him I was, you know, made the decision to go to Tech. We're out of Tech now. Tell us about playing in Canada. A lot of us don't even uh, realize there is football in Canada. Yeah, that's there. true. It was, uh, you know, I got drafted by the Bears and went to, uh, uh, to the Bears training camp, 74. They drafted me as a running back. I said, no, I don't want to play running back. I had enough about my freshman year at Tech. So they said, well, we'll move your defensive back. And uh, so I tried defensive back, and, uh, and I just get burned. <laughs> this was a rookie camp. So anyway, the NFL strike is that year. Mm -hmm. So now the quarterbacks are in camp. And I'm the only one that has any quarterback experience. So I need to play quarterback and make the team. So I spent 74 years as a backup quarterback to Bobby Douglas and Gary Huff. And really learned a lot, and that was quite an you know, education in going from college ball to pro ball. And uh, so the next year I go back to camp and Jack Pardee's the new head coach and uh, Jim Finks is the general manager. And so they, they draft another quarterback. And so I get traded to the Jets. And I go to the Jets and of course when they trade me, you know, they're Pardee and Finks says, oh, this is a great opportunity for you, Joe. Uh, Namath came to camp late. It'd be an opportunity for you to learn under him. And, uh, they're not at all happy with their backups. And, so I get to the Jets, and the uh, first thing the coach tells me to walk in, well, we're going to leave you running back. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, I could say I don't want to play running back, uh, but he said, we're trying to save a, a roster on the team. They've cut the squad from 47 to 43, and we're going to use you as a backup running back and a backup quarterback. Mm -hmm. Well, the running back in their offense was either a pass receiver for Namath or a blocker for Wiggins. <laughs> and uh, I spent the whole time blocking on linebackers and defensive ends. And I think what got me cut from the, the Jets was uh, I missed the block in an exhibition game against the Vikings. And I look up and Namath's on the ground, and his helmet's over there, 
I've got flea marks on my chest from a linebacker running over me. So, uh, but it was a blessing in disguise. So when I go to Canada, and uh, Montreal calls me, you know, they brought me to Canada. And so I went to up there and make it. And, uh, you know, spent 11 years up there. We went to two and five. We played five Grey Cups. We won two. And was MVP of one of them. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to uh, update us on your family. Well, I've uh, Diana. You know, she was a cheerleader out of Tech. We got married. You always dated those cheerleaders. Well, I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, she was young when I had. To, I tell everybody I had to marry a freshman because uh, <laughs> none of the upperclassmen would have me. They knew too much about me. <laughs> But I got a, a little boy, Tim, Joey, and a good athlete, and a little daughter, Joanna, who's 12, and she's got the looks. So she takes after her mom, and Joey's she, taking she, after me. She's got the brains and the looks, and he plays sports. That's right, he plays sports, and uh, more work than tonight. You know? <laughs> good to see you. Thank you, man. Good to see you. Hope you enjoyed our halftime feature. Let's get back to the action now with the Baylor Bears leading the Texas Tech Red Raiders on homecoming evening 14 to 7. Third quarter action, Joe at quarterback. And he's in big trouble and dropped for a loss by Marcus Washington. Five plays later, quarterback Joe up the middle. And the ball recovered by Ron Ferguson for Texas Tech. Red Raiders immediately go to work. Robert Hall throws to Lloyd Hill, complete for gain of 13 yards. Yeah. Two plays later on a second down and 10 at the Baylor 36. Hall is scrambling. Ball is stripped free and recovered by Hafford of Baylor. And the Tech crowd a little quiet at this point as the Red Raiders still trail 14 to 7. On the next Tech possession, Anthony Lynn rambles for 12 yards. Two plays later from the Tech 29. It is Hall throwing for Rodney Blackshear. Picked off by Welch who had a very busy evening for Baylor and he returns to the Tech 46 yard line. Late third quarter action out. Lee Miles on the reverse is knocked out of bounds by Sammy Walker and from the two yard line Robert Strait up the middle for a two yard touchdown run and Baylor now leads 21 to 7 with about a minute 17 to go in the third quarter. Tech's next possession Anthony Lynn trying the right side number 22 gets hit hard but still picks up eight yards. We go to the fourth quarter now with the Red Raiders still trailing by 14. Robert Hall going to the air again. Throws complete to Chris Naughton for a gain of 11 yards. And the very next play from the Tech 33, Hall drops back. Throws complete to Anthony Stinnett for a gain of 23 yards as the Red Raiders are trying to rally. On a third down and eight from the Baylor 42, Hall throws complete in the left flat to Lloyd Hill, but it's just shy of a first down. The Red Raiders just inches short, fourth and less than one. The pitch to Lynn, but he's stacked up by the Baylor Bears for no gain, and the ball goes over. So, a couple of possessions later as the uh, Baylor Bears getting the best of it on the sidelines right now. Less than six minutes to play. Hall scrambles free and races for 20 yards. And this will certainly deserve another look. As freshman redshirt Robert Hall is going to be seen and heard from a lot more in the future. And his running ability certainly adds a, another dimension to the Texas Tech offensive attack. Gain of 20 on that play. Counts first and 10 at the Texas Tech 35. Hall whips the pass out to Shane Sears for a gain of 18 yards. A couple of plays later, it'll be second down and 10 at the Baylor 47. As we go topside again for the camera angle. Hall to Chris Naughton for a gain of 11 yards. Six plays later. Now the less than four minutes to play. Hall for a complete to Shane Sears for a gain of 10 yards. They're on a second down and 10 at the Baylor 13. Hall throws toward the end zone. Ball is tipped by Baylor and caught by Anthony Mediweather for a 13-yard touchdown play. And then the Red Raiders will go for two on the extra point try. And let's see if they can get it. Hall rolling out, throws to Shane Sears. Good for the two-point play. And the Red Raiders trail 21 to 15. But but the Bears managed to run out the remaining three minutes or so on the clock and hang on for a 21 to 15 victory. Now let's take a look at some of the key stats in the ball game for the Red Raiders. Texas Tech with 15 points scored, 26 first downs in the game. And as we mentioned earlier, a record passing performance by quarterback Robert Hall. 47 attempts, he completed 25, had three interceptions, and the Red Raiders totaled 454 yards total offense for the game.
Now the Red Raiders go on the road this weekend as they travel to College Station to take on the Texas Aggies. Dean Slayton, coach of our defensive line, he's the guy we call Sarge. He's the He's in charge of all of our uh, dressing rooms. Uh, he's in charge of the fields, and what a great coach he is. He's from the old school. He's fundamentals, uh, hard work. Uh, Dean's one of those guys that really is hard on kids that play for him. They, it, it, he's very demanding. And the funny thing about it, when these guys come back after being gone two or three years, they don't come to see anybody but Dean. He's the first guy they go to see. Hey, I have the uh, eastern edge of Dallas. I have uh, Plano, Garland, Richardson, Mesquite schools, and then I go up Highway 75 north all the way to Denison. I go south uh, through Course Gun down in 45, now all the way down to nearly to Livingston. So I have a large area because then I work east all the way across to uh, Louisiana, uh, up north to Oklahoma. So I have all the northeast corner uh, uh, of, uh, of the state of Texas. I have lots of schools, uh, a lot of good players in that area, and it's hard to get them out of there because lots of people uh, you know, are recruiting in that area too. Sure. Pretty exciting, all the success you guys have had here recently. Yes, very much talk so. Talk about this program, talk a little bit about it. But, uh, first of all, Eddie, the, uh, just because our program has been coming up like it has and the coaches that we have on our staff are so well known throughout the state that uh, any success we have is magnified because they're all pulling for us. Sure. Uh, not all, you know, but a large majority of them are pulling for us uh, because they know most of us came up through the high school ranks as coaches, and and uh, they come out here to visit, and we really treat them uh, right. Uh, we we give them a lot of attention. We uh, we don't try to uh, hold back secrets as a lot of uh, places try to. A lot of places guys go to visit, and they just kind of give them what we call clinic talk. Uh, we tell them exactly what we do, and we don't mind, uh, and they they appreciate that. We go into a home to talk to a youngster and talk to their parents. What do you sell on this on this program up there? The first thing I sell, Eddie, is the friendliness of the place. That is the very first thing. You know, I just tell them that, uh, you know, hey, when you come out there, you're going to find that I'm just like I am sitting right here. Now, there's going to be times because of maybe if I'm your coach on the field, you may see a little different side of me, and I tell them that. You know, and, and I don't uh, just cater to them and pet them. Uh, you know, but I really sell tech uh, as the friendliness of the place, the quality education they can get, the type of people are going to be around uh, you know, while they're here. I tell them this, hey, you can get a good ed education anywhere you go. You know, you can, because you're going to get out of it what you put into it. Now, it's the people around you during that four or five years that really make it enjoyable. And, and I don't think they can beat this place. I wouldn't leave here. Uh, you know, they may run me off someday, but, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I love it. I On May 11th of 1970, a savage tornado came down from the skies, and when it was gone, Lubbock was changed forever. 
135 million dollars in property damage and many lives were lost in that savage storm. Well, Lubbock bounced back, as evidenced by the Lubbock Memorial Center and most of the new construction in the past 20 years here along 4th Street and 19th Street and Avenue Q in Lubbock. Many great opportunities arose from that tragedy, and one of those occurred at Texas Tech University, according to Dr. James McDonald of the Texas Tech Civil Engineering Department. We first got into the business back in, uh, on May 11th, 1970, when uh, Lubbock, Texas was hit by a devastating tornado that did $135 million worth of damage to our city. Uh, there was a group of young professors at that time uh, who were kind of sitting around looking for a research project and a direction. And the next morning after that storm, we realized that nature had given us a $135 million laboratory. And it turned out to be a, a very op opportune time because uh, there was suddenly a lot of interest in tornadoes from an engineering perspective. Mm -hmm. It's a very unique uh, situation. There's, there's no other university at this time, in the, at least in the United States, that I'm aware of. That, uh, studies tornadoes, particularly from what we call the engineering perspective. Right. Uh, talk about the misconceptions with the tornado. Okay, that's that's the thing that we really uh, discovered early in the game, that there were so many myths and uh, beliefs about tornadoes that simply were not true. Uh, the first one, I guess, was the wind speeds. Uh, Back in 1970, you would frequently hear people talk about tornado wind speeds at 400, 500, and even 600 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. Well, as we began to look at damaged buildings, and as engineers, we could make calculations that would allow us to back figure the wind speeds. We have discovered over a period of years in, in looking at a lot of different types of structures that the wind speeds are more, and I'm talking about maximum wind speeds in the very worst tornadoes, more in the neighborhood of 250 to 300 miles per hour. And from an engineering point of view, that's a lot of difference because loads and buildings are proportional to the square of wind speed, and that makes a heck of a lot of difference. The carryover today is that we are developing tornado resistant designs for uh, not only federal installations such as the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense, but we're doing a lot of work now for commercial companies who have a large computer facility that they want to protect. And uh, many of your major corporations, you know, their, com their computer facility is the heart and soul of the company, and if something happens to it, you know, they're just out of business. Mm -hmm. So we, we are finding more and more applications for this type of work today. From a Texas Tech perspective, from the Texas Tech alum, this is exciting to have Texas Tech really in the forefront in this. Uh, are you finding more and more better students who want to go into this type of research? We're finding that it's, it's uh, much easier to attract graduate students to mm -hmm. our program. And of course, we try to involve our undergraduate students in our research programs as well. And it has been a very effective tool. If we can take a junior or senior student and get him involved in making the targets for the cannon and firing the cannon and taking the data and so forth. He's excited about that. And he, he learns things that uh, he couldn't experience anywhere else. From tragedy to opportunity, from big bangs to big gains, all of that for the Civil Engineering Department at Texas Tech University. For the Red Raider video season ticket, I'm Eddie Clinton. Mike, do you blame some of that uh, inconsistency on you? I'm not blaming a lot of young kids. I'm not looking for an alibi. I just wonder what you think on that. Well, I can't tell that you. Choose. We said this last week. I've said this all week, and I'm not sure people ever hear you because. But when you lose a veteran quarterback, when you lose a guy that's been on the field and he's won nine games for you, 
And uh, I'm going to tell you something. That is a tremendous loss because of the fact uh, that guy has got, he's been trained so long and he's done such a good job. Robert Hall came in and did a great job. And uh, he's just a guy that is learning as far as experience is concerned. We talked about this last week, the, uh, you know, the, the tremendous pressure that you have to start a football game in front of 50,000 people. And you've had all week to think about it. It's a lot harder going into the game and playing. And, uh, and certainly that had some effect on Robert's performance. Uh, I don't think we need to write Robert off and say Robert's not going to be good. Or Robert did this. Robert, Robert played a good football game. Uh, he made some mistakes, as we all did. Uh, the thing about our players, and I, I thought this was key, and, uh, you know, they're they're all in this thing together, and they all support each other. And you couldn't find one guy on our team that that wants to blame anybody. I think they all share in the fact that we lost the game, and they all understand we had enough chances to win the game. So even though we made some mistakes, we made some. Uh, you know, some really bad mistakes uh, that you can't afford to make in a football game. Uh, we, I think, I think we learned a great lesson. I think we can compete with anybody. I mean, I really do believe that. I think we can go play. You know, I, I think we're going to beat A&M. And I, you know, I'm probably nutty as a fruitcake, but I, I still believe that. And uh, by darn it, might, we may not do it, but it'll be after the battle. Let me ask you kind of a question away from the field. After a loss like this, or after a loss like Houston, do you stay up all night? Do you think this thing? Do what's your routine? Oh, I don't. You know, I think you can overplay that. I, I'd like to go to sleep, <laughs> you know, <laughs> after a while. But uh, you just, yeah, I tell you, you get up so tight, uh, Eddie, and you get so emotionally involved in the game. It's really win or lose. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's no different. It's hard to sleep, and. Uh, and it's, it's just that way. You get so emotionally involved in a football game and you, you know, you're hollering, your head hurts so bad when the thing is over and you, you know, and you've been in that locker room and you've seen those guys that are broken hard and devastated and, and it, you just think about 75 million things and, uh, and it's hard. It really is hard. And it's, uh, I tell you that there's no cliche, and this is really the truth. The thrill of victory lasts about a minute. You know, you go win the game, say, "All right, man, now settle down. We're going to get ready for a &M. And you lose the game, it lasts for you know three or four days if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. And uh, the agony of defeat is certainly something that's hard to overcome if you put a lot into it. And our guys are they're hurt because it was a big game for them, but uh, but that they'll prevail. That they'll be all right. When will you stop thinking about Baylor and start thinking about a &M? I hope quick. Uh, I would say that, you know, what you do and what we do is we look at the film tomorrow on Sunday. We, as coaches, we grade it early and we look at the film on Sunday and about 4 o'clock Sunday afternoon after we, or 5 o'clock after we've looked at all the film of Baylor, we start talking about A&M. And so uh, hopefully by, by Sunday night we're through thinking about and talking about Baylor. I look forward to going to A&M. I'll see you next week. Thanks a lot, Eddie. We appreciate it. <laughs>